Hello there, my name is Fred Berkey. I'm an extension agent with the University of Florida IFAS. My territory is Martin County, St. Lucie County, and the city of Stewart. My program is Florida Yards and Neighborhoods, which is an environmental educational outreach program to, to teach you, the general public, how to better understand and take care of your environment. This is my TV program, Your Florida Yard. My guest today is a very special guest and a friend of mine from Palm Beach County, Mr. Bill Shaw. Bill, Great it's friend. wonderful to have you here. Great to he is a the commercial horticultural extension agent and environmental horticultural program leader for Palm Beach County. Uh, his responsibilities include developing and implementing educational programming for Palm Beach's nursery, landscape, pest management industries with a focus on integrated pest management, business management, and marketing and sustainable nursery production. Holy cat, you got a lot to do there. Lots of responsibility. Really what I have you here for is that you are definitely one of the gurus for the University of Florida. I think this would be through your IPM uh, program yes. on Whitefly. Yes. In Martin County, we've had a lot of problems with this. So we're getting a lot of calls with uh, people, residents, and commercial operators on exactly how to identify and how to take care of it. So this is what I'd really like to talk about. And I think we're just going to start out really basically, what's a white fly? Well, a white fly is a small insect. They can vary in size. The adults from about the size, the head of a straight pin up to about 3 sixteenths of an inch. They're white colored, they can have wax on them, and they, uh, you'll see them flying around your plants when they're infested, and they feed on the plants and cause damage to the plants, and that's why we're concerned about them. So you actually can see these then? You can see them uh, with the naked eye, although there are certain parts of their life stages that it's much easier to see them with a magnifying lens. Well, you know, of course, anytime we get into uh, these IPM programs, we need to know the life cycles and for reasons that you can tell us, but mm -hmm. what are the life cycles for these uh, white flies? Well, white flies all have the same general life cycle, which we call uh, complete metamorphosis, technically, but they have an egg, and then out of that egg emerges a little insect that crawls around for a short period of time, and then it settles in on the plant and goes through several uh, youthful stages, we call nymph stages, and then out of the final pupil stage, an adult white fly emerges. Okay, so, and the other thing too is, I mean, are there a number of different types of white fly? There, in Florida, we estimate there are 60 to 65 different species of white flies uh, worldwide, uh, depending on who you talk to, 1,200 to 1,500 species of white flies. So oh, clear, yeah, clearly we don't have everything that's uh, in the world, thankfully, but we do have a few in Florida that are a problem. Not all of them are a real problem. Now, are the life cycles for all these different kinds the same? They're pretty similar. Those youth stages, of which they go through several of them, can vary in number among the different species sometimes. Now, what stage is the most damaging to our local plants? Well, anything other than the egg stage is damaging because they all feed on the plants. Oh, really? Right. So the different, I mean, once they lay the egg and it starts to come out, well, then they're starting feeding somewhere. Right, right. Can you see that damage? Or do they do most of the, the damage that we look at uh, as the adult? Uh, well, they do most of the damage probably as the nymphs or the youngsters. Um, the, but remember, they're very tiny, so you need to develop a large number of them before you start to see them or even notice their damage. So they have to build up in population. So it's a, it's a cumulative thing yeah. of all the life stages feeding on it. So it's time. numbers that do the thing. Absolutely. How do they do their damage? Uh, they have a, a mouth part that's like a hypodermic needle. Uh, we call it a stylet or a beak. And they insert it down into the tissue of the plant and suck out the plant juices. OK. Mm -hmm. This leaves a mark then? It can cause a mark. Uh, it causes a, a, a decline of the plant, a yellowing. Uh, with many of the plants, like Ficus benjamina, the weeping fig, uh, over time it'll cause all the leaves to drop off, that type of damage. Yeah. Now, can, one thing that I hear a lot about, can they transmit diseases? I mean, similar to what we're seeing in the greening with citrus and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense because of the hypodermic needle type feeding they do. Not all of them transmit diseases. Um, the ones we're most concerned with in the landscape 
typically don't transmit too many diseases. There are some that do. Uh, there's one called silver leaf white fly that transmits a virus to tomatoes, for instance. But holy, that's, holy cat. Yeah, that's more of a concern if you have a vegetable garden. Yeah, I think most of the concern that we have here with the general public is what we see just on the regular landscape plants. Right. Uh, and I think it can also affect tree. Well, you said ficus, so we'll go into that in a minute. Sure. Now, they talk about this thing that uh, uh, honeydew. Mm -hmm. Now, ex tell us what that is and exactly how that happens. Okay. Well, the uh, insect has its uh, beak or stylet in the plant and it's sucking out the plant juices. And they're mostly after the protein and amino acids in there. So there's a tremendous amount of water and sugar Oh, that sugar. is, okay. is uh, waste material for them, so they excrete it. And it's, it's much like a sugary syrup. Uh, so they excrete that, and again, when you get large numbers of insects, it can cover the plant. Uh, it can drip down on things that are underneath the plant into pools and that type of thing. And then you'll get a mold that grows on it, too, that causes a, a kind of a sooty, we call it sooty mold, a blackening of the plant. So when you have that sooty mold and you see the glistening honeydew, that's an indication to look for those insects on there. Yeah. It's excrement is what this it is. This is also the stage, this is when you would probably be attracting ants? Correct. Um, because of that sugary honeydew, ants actually uh, protect these insects and they'll, it's almost like they're farming them and they'll harvest the honeydew and then at certain times of the year when the ants want more protein, they'll harvest some of the insects. They, so the ants could be bringing in the white flies? They could. They could be spreading well, them I, around. I didn't know mm -hmm. that. I'll mm -hmm. be doggone. Yeah. But uh, just so the public knows, the ants are not a problem for the plant, are they? No. Well, the ants aren't typically a problem for the plant, uh, but of course this helps bump up ant populations. So if you've got an ant problem in your home, the first place to look is out on your plants around your home and see if they have ants and honeydew and insects causing oh, honeydew. Be okay, so, so that the ants that are out there could be coming into your home. Yes, uh, and most of our worst pest ones do. So one of the techniques for controlling ants, I know we're not talking about those, is to control the piercing, sucking, we call these kind of insects, the white flies and others, on the plants around your home. Okay, got it. The sooty mold, now, this is what people see, and they think that this is, oh, my goodness, something's mm -hmm. happening to my plant. Right. I get these calls, I'm sure you do too, and mm -hmm. thinking that is really the culprit of why right. the problem with the plant. Does it have anything to do with the demise or, or the problems with the plant? Well, sooty mold, uh, mold is not actually a disease of the plant. It's just growing on the honeydew. So it's, it's damage it causes is, of course, it creates a mess a lot of times, but it also blocks if it's real heavy, it'll block the sunlight from hitting the leaves and it'll reduce photosynthesis. So that all adds to the stress that's on the plants. So it really doesn't harm the plant as far as leaving pock marks and all no. that. It's just there and it could possibly uh, restrict photosynthesis. Right. Like and it's more of an aesthetic thing, kind of a messy thing, uh, which you do like to try and control it. But the way you control it is by controlling the insects right. that are producing. Does it slough off then? It will, uh, over time, uh, depending on whether the insects continue to produce the honeydew or not. And then there are certain insecticide treatments you can use, which we'll talk about later on, that right. help it slough off, too. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's really not bad for the plant itself? No, now. no. It's just an indication that you've got a pest, right. so start looking for the pest. Right. I think what I want to do now is sort of talk about some of the recent whitefly issues that we've had in South Florida. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe the different kinds that you could have. And I noticed that one came up and it was bonders? Bondars nesting. Bondars nesting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that and what the hosts are. Well, the bondars nesting whitefly is a relatively new one. Um, it's like some of the others that are a problem right now. They produce a lot of wax and a lot of honeydew and a lot of sooty mold. The thing that makes them identifiable is they create a little circle of wax, uh, fluffy wax, about a quarter inch across, and a lot of times uh, the white fly will be right in the middle of that circle there. So this is the identifying way you can tell? That's one way you can tell them apart, because sometimes you'll have two or, or more white fly species on individual plants, too. Well, also, each of these different types that we're going to talk about, they have specific host plants, is they that do. correct? They do. And what are some of the hosts for this? Bondar? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, well, the bondars, uh, you'll, you, you find it on ficus a lot, and you'll find it on hibiscus. 
uh, and a few other plants, but typically where you see another one we're going to talk about, the Ragosa spiraling whitefly, right. typically that's where you find also the bondars nesting. So I don't know if it's a secondary thing or it comes into that environment where it likes it, but it hasn't become a real major pest for us yet. So you actually can have several different types of whitefly on one plant. It depends on the plant, uh, but in the case of, of ficus and different kinds of ficus, there, there are two or three different ones that can get on them. Holy cat, what type of damage do they do? Well, the, the bondars nesting whitefly, um, they're, again, they're piercing sucking, so they produce all this honeydew. Right. Uh, so they, they put stress on the plant by removing the plant juices and then uh, cover the plant with the wax and the honeydew, which the sooty mold grows on. And then, of course, the ants will be on there protecting them as well. A little confused about the wax. So this looks different than the honeydew or the sooty mold. It does. It's white. Okay, so that's the distinguishing. Right, it's white. Um, another name for it is, is flocculent, too. Okay, mm -hmm. flocculent which, what now? <laughs> flocculent also. <laughs> which, if you think of the, uh, the holiday trays where you spray the white, sure. kind of snow-like flocculent on okay, there, that's, that's kind of what it looks like, that's yeah. A, that's but good, maybe not quite as yeah. heavy as what you'd cover a tree with. Well, I think the next one, and I see a lot of this in my neighborhood, is the ficus. Right. And uh, I see a lot of defoliation, and, and actually people get concerned, they think the plant's going to mm -hmm. die. Mm -hmm. But so this is, tell us a little bit about the ficus whitefly. Okay. Uh, the ficus whitefly has uh, been in um, South Florida uh, for several years, a few years here in Martin County, uh, St. Lucie County. The, uh, it does not produce honeydew, so that makes it different, oh, and, it it, and it does not produce all the wax. So you won't see that on the, the weeping figure, the ficus benjamina. But what happens is the populations of this white fly, if you've had a, a fairly hard winter, will start to build up around April. And they build up and they build up and they build up. Uh, and they go up and down. And then through the summer, uh, late summer and fall, then you get defoliation of the ficus plants. So because ficus benjamina is planted as a, a hedge, kind of a barrier to roads a lot of times and so on, or blocking people's backyards, uh, privacy, that type of thing. When they defoliate, it creates a big problem. Sure, because so, you can see through. And, right. Uh, it, well, it looks bad, too. It looks know. bad. And then additionally, it seems we're, we're beginning to see, uh, you know, kind of cumulative stress on these ficus benjaminas take some of them out. We don't think it's the white fly that are taking it out. We just think they're adding to the stress that are on those plants hmm. that are coming from other things we normally do with them. Well, obviously, the main host plant would be ficus. Right. Are there any other? Does it affect any other plants? No. Uh, the ficus whitefly only affects ficus and mostly just ficus benjamina. Oh, really? Yeah. It'll, it'll affect some other... Um, like nitida and some of the... Uh, a little bit. It, they will uh, they'll deposit eggs on nitida, which is uh, ficus microcarpa. Uh, but um, uh, they won't do well on there and they won't defoliate it. So, and of course, that's the one that we use primarily for hedges, just like you're talking about. The ficus benjamina, yes. Knitted is also used as a hedge as well, but not quite as much. Now, does it also affect the trees? I mean, as you let these ficus grow, of course, they'll go into a tree. Right. Uh, well, if we're talking about the ficus benjamina, the weeping fig, yes, the white fly will affect it, whether it's a shrub or a tree. Uh, the effects sometimes seem to be worse on shrubs. Uh, I don't think there's any research that shows that, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, we think it's related to the stresses we put on hedges by the heavy shearing, and sometimes they get too wet or they get too dry or they don't get fertilized enough, those types of things. Well, you know, and I, maybe that we're too early in this, but yes. in our area, I've seen these big, long hedges. Right. They can be six and seven, maybe even eight, eight feet tall, mm -hmm. and you'll see where the, the whitefly have damaged them, and they'll lose their leaves, but then all of a sudden, it sort of declines. Right. Is this where the beneficials take over? In other words, is this something that will defoliate the whole hedge, or after a point of, of time, does it get better? Um, well... Uh, I think the potential for it is to get better over time. Uh, here in, in Martin and St. Lucie counties, you folks are on kind of the edge of right. this expansion of this insect. And so typically with new invasive insects, we have a cycle where they're bad, really bad for a couple of years, 
and then beneficial insects start uh, getting them under control. We're beginning to see that where this insect originated in Florida, down in Miami-Dade County and Broward County, and even Palm Beach County, people are not reporting as much uh, in the way of ficus white fly this year as they have in the past. Now we have to be careful because in previous years they've dropped off and then they've come back come like in. gangbusters too. So, uh, uh, but there are at least five uh, predator beetles that have been identified that attack them that are okay. out there in the environment. There's little parasitic parasitic, or we call them parasitoid wasps, little tiny things that don't harm humans, about the size of a little gnat that uh, parasitize these things. So those and probably some insect diseases are, are reducing the populations in those areas where this white fly has been the longest. So that's the hope we have for a lot of these white flies is they'll be bad for a few years where we have to apply a lot of pesticides to control them, but hopefully uh, the beneficials will start getting them, getting them under control over time. See, that's pretty neat. That's yeah. the way we'd like to see that's it happen. That's the way we'd like right? to see it happen. Yeah. Now I'm going to get to the one that really, at least it looks the most problematic. Mm -hmm. This is the one that I get most of the calls on. And I've got to tell you, people really get upset about this. And this mm -hmm. is the spiraling white fly. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, the Ragose spiraling white fly, uh, it gets its name, the spiraling comes from the way it deposits its eggs in kind of a circular pattern. And that will have a lot of wax on it too. And that's one of the identifying characteristics. That's how you can tell the difference between that and the other ones uh, that are out there. It's also a very, very large, one of the largest white flies. So that's one that gets up to about 3 sixteenths of an inch. So you can definitely see these things. They're, they're massive by white fly standards. Oh, yeah. But um, they're, uh, they're a huge problem uh, throughout coastal South Florida right now, in particular. Uh, they may spread further, they probably will over time, but they produce huge amounts of wax, the flocculent, huge amounts of honeydew, uh, then of course huge amounts of sooty mold. Uh, all of that drips onto cars and homes and into pools right. and neutralizes pool chemicals and it's hard to keep them cleaned out. Uh, turns your furniture underneath, sidewalks black from all the sooty mold. Um, they're not known to kill any plants, but again, they're creating stress on the plants too. Yeah. But it's this tremendous mess they make that's really the problem. Yeah, and, and I think that this is something that they're, they're very concerned about. They right. see the mess, they see the defoliation sometimes, and they mm -hmm. think, oh my goodness, the plant's going to die, it's making a mess, mm -hmm. what do I do? Mm -hmm. And of course, this has uh, unfortunately brought an opportunity for some people that possibly don't know what they're doing to mm -hmm tell homeowners that, hey, if I don't take care of this for you, it's going to die. Right. And actually, did I hear you say that really it probably won't kill the shrub or the, uh, the tree? That's correct. Just the white flies, these ones we're talking about by themselves, will not. Okay. Um, we are, like I said, we're seeing some die back in the weeping figs, the ficus benjamina, but that's more a function of the white flies along with other stresses over a few years, typically. Yeah. I had a, a little bit of a, a, a problem even in my neighborhood where a neighbor called up and said that he had been approached by somebody and said, if I don't take care of this, this, uh, this shrub or this tree or these mm -hmm. trees, uh, it's gonna, uh, it's, they're going to die. Mm -hmm. And the, the application rate was expensive, mm -hmm. and he's had to, he, he had to do it repetitively for four times. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is possibly he might not have had to do this? Um. That's correct. And we're getting in milky situation. Yeah, yeah here, that's right? correct. Um, the you know, uh, but year after year, if you have these white flies hitting that plant, you know, then you, it's that stress that causes a decline. But but typically, you don't get the white fly, then the plant dies. That that doesn't happen. All right, and I, I have here, and you've already, I think, already answered this, but how can you monitor for white fly? Mm -hmm. And at what stage would you look for? Would you wait until you see the evidence that you've got a problem, or would you go out and, and what we call scout and see if you've mm -hmm. got a problem coming up? Right, scouting or monitoring is a good thing. Uh, if you know the plants that are heavily affected um, with the ragose spiraling white fly, we're talking about coconuts, gumbo limbos, black olives, white birds of paradise, uh, Calophyllum is probably those that are hit heaviest, right. but there's a huge host range for these. They'll hit a lot of other palms and other plants too. But if you've got those plants in particular, you want to be looking for them out there. 
Uh, look for the sooty mold, look for the glistening honeydew, look for the little small, they look like a tiny little white moth almost, I've heard them described before. Uh, be aware there's a lot of other little tiny insects out there too, so just because you see a lot of little tiny insects flying around, that doesn't mean they're white flies. But start looking for those signs of, of those things that they produce and try now, to catch them early. Once they've found this, what we were calling host plants, the right. one that they're affecting, right. are they there all the time? Uh, the reason I ask that is this something where you could go up very carefully and just flick it and see them fly away and then you'd know, hey, I got white fly? Uh, it depends on which white fly you're talking about. Um, a lot of times uh, with the ficus white fly on the ficus benjamina, you'll look for their young stages, on, mostly on the undersides of the leaves, and they look like little tiny scale insects okay. about the size of a, the head of a straight pin. You may or may not see the adults flying around. Um, the adult populations go up and down and up and down and up and down through the season, so if you happen to catch it at a time when they're down, you may not see adults. But look especially on the underside of the leaves for the ficus benjamina. Uh, for the ragose spiraling white fly, you're more likely to see the spiraling egg patterns and lots of wax as a sign. And there may be some adults on there. Usually they are. They're, they're, they're almost not afraid of you. They'll just sit there a lot of times when you look at sure. them. And the ragose, an interesting thing about the ragose spiraling white fly is they line up in a line like cattle along the veins in the leaf. And then they're like synchronized swimmers. They'll all turn in unison in a circle You're and sometimes me. turn back. We don't know why they do that. But if yeah. you see that, that's the ragose spiraling. And language. this would all be on the underside of the leaf? Mostly on the underside. Now, yeah. at this stage, would you all see, also see the sooty mole? You would. Once, once you uh, see the wax and the eggs being deposited and so on, you'll see honeydew and sooty mold with the ragose spiraling white fly and with the bondar's nesting white fly. Remember, the ficus white fly doesn't produce right. honeydew and therefore no sooty mold or wax. Yeah. Now, you've got this sooty mold and you've got this honeydew. How can you remove that so that it doesn't look so crummy? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> if we could come up with that, we would, we would, we uh, would, uh, you know, solve a big problem. Um, it's, well, on furniture and that type of thing, you know, the way you would clean that, you know, with your detergents or your pressure cleaners mm -hmm. or that type of thing, homes and that thing. On the plants, it's more difficult because you don't want to damage the plant. Probably the best method, like I said, is to get the insect under control. Okay. One of the treatments you can use, it doesn't knock them out, but it helps are insecticidal soaps or insecticidal oils, which you want to use properly. But both of those dry out that sooty mold and help it flake off over a couple week period of time. It well, won't clean it completely, but it'll right. help. Plus the fact this would be considered an organic way of doing it too, would it not? Uh, or or yes. a, a environmental environmentally friendly way to do right. it, rather Soaps than an and insecticide. Oils. Soaps yeah. and oils are considered uh, less toxic and, and therefore a lot of uh, organic certification programs for vegetable production sure. allow them. So. And this is different than the using the insecticides, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So that, would this be considered a biological control, or is biological is using other insects? Is that correct? Right. Biological is when you're using insects or insect diseases or some sort of um, byproduct of those uh, uh, living things to try and control the insects. The, the term, it gets getting a little technical, but the term we use for these softer pesticides like soaps and oils, we would call biorationals. Oh, okay. Biorationals versus biological. Okay. Would a homeowner uh, be using the biological controls, though, or is this strictly for commercial? For white flies, um, there aren't any commercially available biologicals that are effective on these white oh, flies. Oh, they are not. There's, there's, there's some that are out there, and there's ones that are being released experimentally here in the state uh, by University of Florida researchers and also Florida Department of Ag researchers. So there's a lot of research work going on to identify what are the good biologicals, but there are none that are commercially available commercially. that have been shown to be effective. Gotcha. Yeah. There are several that are being sold and used and released that are commercially available, but they're, they're not uh, necessarily doing a great job. Well, this brings it back then. What are some of the natural predators uh, for the white fly? Um, well, for uh, the ragose spiraling white fly, there's a beetle, a predator beetle called Nephaspis. 
Uh, there's a couple of parasitoid wasps that have been shown to be effective. Sure. They're in the, the genus Incarsia. There, you want to know all this technical stuff? <laughs> How do you remember all this stuff, Bill? <laughs> it's uh, just uh, repeated a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, so there's, those are the ones that show the most promise for the uh, rugose. Um, for the uh, ficus uh, uh, white fly, there's at least five naturally occurring uh, small little beetles out there and a couple of wasps uh, that are out there. Um, and that's a good rule of thumb. If you see these colonies and you see little tiny beetles running around in there, or what looks like a little dragon running around in there sometimes, those which are the larvae of these beetles, those beetles are predators, so they're, mm -hmm. they're helping you out there. I think that a lot of times uh, we forget that when you turn a leaf over, I mean, we've got all these different kinds of insects, and some mm -hmm. of them are very, very worthwhile. Right. And usually the ones that are running around fast looking for food might be the better ones. Right. Yeah. And well, so people need to remember that uh, just because you see it doesn't mean you have to start spraying them because they could be the good guys. They could be the good guys. And remember, as we mentioned earlier, they may be part of the formula that helps solve the problem over time sure. as these beneficial numbers increase to meet the, the need on these white flies. Well, the there's always a symbiotic relationship here. I mean, you're not going to get the good guys unless you got the bad guys. Right. Uh, but they are the ones that keep it under control. Right. Yeah. So they're not they're not controlling it completely right, right now. Exactly. But but they are helping. Right. So you want to do everything you can to encourage those good guys, as you say. Well, now we'll get into some of the chemical controls. Mm -hmm. I know that we have some products that are very very effective. Mm -hmm. um, I need to know possibly if you recommend them and which ones you might do, and how effective they are. Mm -hmm. But after talking to you a little bit here, are they really necessary? Um, I think so because, um, at least over the short term, I think they're necessary because uh, with the ficus benjamina, the weeping fig, the hedges, you don't want them to defoliate. And then again over time they'll, they'll decline if they're always defoliating too. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think in that case it, it merits treatment. And with the rugose spiraling or the bondors, um, they, they create a heck of a mess. And you may say, well, that's, that's not that big of a deal. But if you live underneath that and your, <laughs> your feet stick to your sidewalk as you walk in the front door and you drag it over your carpet and, you know, I mean, that's, or you can't use your pool because it's too gunked up, uh, those things all kind of affect our quality of life here. So um, I think if you use them properly, they can do a good job and are part of the, the uh, plan, I think, to keep them under control over the short term. Over the long term, probably not sustainable. It gets right. pretty expensive. Right. Well, then that brings up over the long term, uh, how often would you spray if you use these materials? Mm -hmm. I mean, you wait a month, two weeks? Um, or do well, you just wait for the cause and the effect and see how, how well yeah, you've done? Another good question. Um, with the uh, ficus, well, we usually don't spray. That's not the recommended. Unless you're using a soap or an oil and you're willing to get out there every two, three weeks until you get them under control, then you may be able to knock them down with those. So you could, you could use those techniques. Remember, oils need to be used as properly, especially in the summer. Right. Because you can get a lot of burning sure. if you're, you don't use the right concentration, spray at the right time, and that type of thing. But what we recommend are a group of insecticides that are absorbed through the plant and they move through the plant. We call those systemics. That's great. Systemics, and they're either applied to the soil um, and some professional products, which are also applied to the trunks on trees, which is a nice technique, and then some are also injected into the trunks. Mm -hmm. And those systemics, if you think about it, they move through the plant, and so when these white flies with their, their uh, stylet or their hypodermic like needle are feeding then the pesticides moving through the plant and they suck out that insecticide and then you get better control. So that gives you your longest lasting control uh, compared to spraying. But is this, are these materials available to the public? Some of them are. You can go to the local uh, uh, garden center uh, and pick up some products um, the box stores. Now the box about. stores also would be uh, good sources for those. Uh, there's a Bayer product called Bayer Advanced Tree and Shrub Insect Killer. Uh, it's got a systemic in it. Uh, there's an ortho product uh, with a similar name. 
and there's some uh, uh, green light products that have similar names, and then there's also ones that are um, citrus and fruit tree ones. But the key is you want to get these systemic. So if you go to the garden center, this is going to get a little technical again, but you want to ask for the systemics for treating whitefly that you apply to the soil. And uh, there's, I'm going to mention these. Uh, maybe you can put them up on the screen at some point. Yeah, we definitely will. But uh, you want to look, ask for an active ingredient, imidacloprid, uh, acetometoprid, or dinotefuran. Dinotefuran. Those are the three that are available in homeowner products. Um, there are others that professionals can get a hold of too, but they're all, they're all uh, systemic, meaning they move through the plant and they're in one category of chemicals that are chemically, they're kind of closely related to nicotine. Huh. Okay. Yeah, but, but they behave differently and they're much less toxic to people. Now you say this, the, the, you would apply it to the soil, so this could be a granular or a liquid. They, uh, they come, depending on the product, they come in liquid or granular forms. Sure. Uh, when you apply a liquid form, you want to make sure you put it down with plenty of water, as the label says, and then keep the plants well watered for a couple of weeks because you want that insecticide to stay in solution in the soil so the roots can absorb a maximum amount of it. If it's granular, you want to do the same thing. You want to water it in and keep the plants watered uh, because you think about it, anything that's helping the roots work better, that's going to help pick up that pesticide better and move it into the plant better. Sure. And of course, when we're talking about these products, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe Bear puts that out, or maybe Ortho, or the different ones. But on the little tiny letters, and the active ingredient is right. what you're really looking for to make sure you've got the product. Those active ingredients, uh, that's where you're looking. It's on the label, and it'll tell you what percent that is. And those were the three that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, and I think you're correct. Those are all very good products. Uh, all right. Uh, how do the environmental conditions affect this? What I'm looking for is the time of year. I mean, we've right. got like, you know, during the summer, when it's hotter or when it's cooler. Mm -hmm. Does this shut things down? Does this control it a little bit? Uh, another good question. Typically, these white fly, pop, white fly populations take off in the spring as the plants begin to grow. If you have had a very, uh, if you had a freeze or some cold snaps, during the winter, those helped knock down these whitefly populations during the winter. Uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but whiteflies are a tropical insect. So that's, uh, uh, they come from the tropics, and so when it gets real cold, they don't like it, and you kill a number of them off, unfortunately not all of them. If you've had a mild winter like we had last winter, the, uh, you don't kill that many of them, so they take off earlier in the spring. So. Uh, uh, your populations take off and then they build up and build up through the summer and into the fall. And like I said, with the Ficus benjamina, that's when you get the defoliation. But you typically want to start treating in the spring. With the Ficus white fly, if you treat with the right concentration early spring, it'll last you until the winter. Okay. Uh, one treatment. But it's got to be the right concentration. And most times people get into trouble. Uh, for a couple of reasons with that, but in part because they don't put enough down. With the Rigose spiraling and the Bondars, you're probably going to have to treat at least twice. And the soil treatments can take a good four to six weeks six or weeks. so, okay. especially on a big coconut tree before you start seeing results up there, especially on the older fronds where most of the white flies are at, too. So it's safe to say that all of them, it, it would probably be better to start in the spring, though, would not it? Right. I, usually around uh, uh, April, March, April is a good time to be thinking about your, your initial treatment. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, now I want to talk about a little bit, let's say we've got this ficus hedge, and you've let it go, and it really looks pretty crummy. Mm -hmm. What really should you do to these damaged plants? I mean, should, I mean, do you go in and prune them? I mean, do you just let them come back on their own, or mm -hmm. what, what's the procedure there? Yeah, ficus hedges, um, you want to, we've talked about the stress factor several times, and you want to do whatever you can to create as little stress and the most optimal growing conditions you can for the plant. So when you think about it, uh, the ficus benjamina or weeping fig, we shear it and shear it and shear it and shear it. And it's one of those plants that in the past has grown so well down here 
that the plant tolerated it. But you add some additional stress in there. So you got a double stress. That shearing is a massive stress. So one of the recommendations is not to quit shearing them, but to try and reduce your shearing a little bit. So uh, you're not shearing them number one so hard. You're not cutting them back right to the wood type of thing. And try and leave a little more green leaves on there. Because remember, the leaves are the ones that collect the sunlight, create the sugars for the energy for the plant to fight these things off and to fight off other problems. So one recommendation is to try and minimize the shearing as much as possible. We realize you can't let them grow into an 80-foot tree in a lot of spots, but, uh, but keep them as a hedge and reduce the shearing as much as is practically possible. Uh, with your fertilization, you want to maintain uh, a, a good fertilization program. When they're uh, defoliated, you don't want to go in and, and dump a heavy application of fertilizer on them because too much fertilizer uh, is also a stress factor. It's a lot of the fertilizer is salt. So if you think of dumping salt on your plant, you want to have it, you know, as a fertilizer, you don't want to put it so heavy that you're damaging the plant, the heavy application. Plus, um, if you're pushing them too hard with fertilizer, uh, even there, if it's not burning them, that adds additional stress to the plant initially. So uh, a lighter fertilizer application if you're trying to get plants to recover. Uh, if you can go in and determine what's dead or not dead, or maybe you need to wait several weeks at least to see what leafs back out again, uh, but you want to at some point remove the dead material. One way you can tell if a twig's dead or alive, if you scratch oh, the yeah, bark. Sure. You maybe have talked about that before sure. on other shows. And if it's a little bit green underneath that bark, then it's still alive. If it's not, then that's probably dead. Yeah, um, sure sign. Just yeah. scratch it and you yeah. got some green there, you're yeah. all right. Be sure yeah. you don't, yeah, and also be sure you don't, you're not overwatering too. You don't want to yeah. get out there and start dumping a lot of water on a plant that's not growing very much because that water is just going to be sitting there around the roots, stressing the roots and maybe causing some root rot. I see that probably as the biggest problem is overwatering and fertilizing where people are trying to push these plants yeah, to come back. Yeah, they want to make it better. And, and, right. and sometimes they're pushing them over the edge and, and yeah, killing their like plants. someone with a major operation and giving them a steak dinner the next yeah, day. Well, you know, good. especially <laughs> if the doctor said don't eat steak for, yeah, right, you know, right, for a couple right. of weeks at least. You know? Well, so at, at what you're really saying is that these could be different stresses. You could have cold stress, fertilizer stress, water stress. I mean, so, and you're just adding a stress to a stress, and this is right. what really can cause the damage. Yeah, so think, of, think in terms of coke them out. And you mentioned a great one that we have, deal with uh, every year almost is, is the cold too. That has yeah. a very large impact on these plants too. All right, we'll sort of round it out with okay. the thing that really people worry about, is this plant going to die? Mm -hmm. And I think you've pretty well answered it. If they don't put too many stresses on it, right. it probably won't. Correct. And so if you just take care of the plant, sort of nurse it along, I think you're, you know, and we let the beneficials come in and do their job, I think they're gonna be fine. Uh, is this, would this be what you would consider the best management practice? I would, um, and one reason I like the soil treatments is because you're not directly spraying the leaves where your beneficials are at. Um, all insecticides will have some impact on beneficials. Oh, I thought of, I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah, but if you get out and you spray the foliage, then you're directly getting that pesticide onto the uh, beneficial insects, and you're killing them too. So by treating the soil systemically, you're directly affecting the pests, maybe a little bit indirectly affecting the beneficials, but you're picking the best of your options and that's the best way to go with that. Well, that's good advice because I was thinking, unfortunately, that the spray was a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely correct. I mean, you're hitting the beneficials as well as the mm -hmm. target. Whereas the other way, unless they put their little thing down in there and they mm -hmm. suck it out, mm -hmm. uh, they're not gonna get whacked with and, the, the yeah. uh, systemic. And the other factor is even if you spray the systemic, and not all of them are labeled for spraying, but if you get one that's labeled for spraying, it only lasts for three weeks, maybe right. four weeks, versus on the, on the weeping fig, uh, that uh, ficus whitefly, you can get eight, 10 months if you put down enough of the product on the soil. So it's gonna cost you more to do the soil application than a light spraying, but you're not gonna have to come back every three to four weeks and spray it. Gotcha. Again. 
Bill, you've done a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank it's amazing you. how much you've got up there. I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> how do you remember all that I'm stuff? I'm empty now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I emptied you out. Huh? Well, listen, I think I really, really appreciate you coming. This is a concern that we've had in Martin County. And uh, hopefully the public now realizes that, number one, if you don't put extra stress on it, your plant is not going to die but you need to follow his recommendations and take care of this problem. And it seems like it's fairly easy to do. So I appreciate mm -hmm. you coming. My Thank pleasure. you so much. Thanks. So I want to round this out. I, want to pr I appreciate you watching. And this is Farmer Fred saying I'll see you next month.